All right, welcome to the John David Ebert School for the Study of Culture, Cosmology, and the Arts, and to our first James Joyce class, Understanding James Joyce, Part 1, A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, which will then follow with uh, class number two will be on Ulysses. Um, it's very important to go through A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man uh, because you won't understand what's going on in Ulysses, where the main character, Stephen Dedalus, who is James Joyce's alter ego, uh, originates in, in uh, um, Portrait of the Artist. And so now, uh, Joyce was born in 1882 in Dublin. He spent his first 20 years there. He does die in Zurich uh, at the age of 58, about one month shy of his 59th birthday in 1941, two years after the publication of Finnegan's Wake. Um, and it's too bad that he had died because he had been planning another uh, epic after Finnegan's Wake, a meditation on the sea. Uh, one can only imagine what that would have been. Uh, though the difficult, the language of Finnegan's Wake is probably the most difficult uh, language ever to be uh, wrought in the English language. He said he had planned for his uh, unwritten epic on the sea for the language to be simple, luminous, and clear. So that's a major loss. Uh, but anyhow, we have these four great works. We have Dubliners, which I want to spend this first class looking at the stories in Dubliners because I think it forms an essential backdrop. It introduces us to Joyce's whole world. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Dubliners was published he, now he was writing the early draft of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man called Stephen Hero uh, back uh, right around the age of 20, 20, 21, 22. In 1904 to 1906, he was working on it, but it was too long. It was like a thousand pages. Uh, and later he threw it into the fire and his wife, Nora, rescued it from the fire. Uh, luckily, uh, we don't have the whole thing. We just have sort of the middle section and uh, what's there, it's good, it's not great, but it's good, it's, it's very self-assured, very confident. It is astonishing to think that a man who never lifted his hand to write uh, fiction in his life all of a sudden just starts writing it, and it's like, it's a very accomplished prose, there's nothing awkward about it. It's too long, and it's too expansive. There are too many details of Stephen's life. He's basically writing an autobiography. He's writing about himself uh, at school, at, uh, I believe it's Trinity College, you know, writing about himself uh, and all the daily banalities and him forming his own aesthetic theory. Now, <clears throat> a portrait of the artist as a young man is called a portrait of the artist as a young man. It's not the only one. Uh, Marcel Proust, for instance, was doing exactly the same thing, writing his literary autobiography as, a port as uh, the remembrance of things past in Paris at exactly the same time and was also casting himself in that uh, novel and is also an autobiography so this isn't an unheard of thing to do to put yourself into a novel change your name and then write your life story uh, it's not by any means unheard of and other writers were probably doing the same thing as Joyce and Proust two of the greatest writers of the 20th century I highly recommend a Remembrance of Things Past reading through the whole thing I read it after I got out of college I, I went through the whole thing and it's absolutely magnificent and exquisite um, exquisitely beautiful okay then so um, so he's writing a portrait, um, but he interrupted Stephen Hero. Back to Stephen Hero, meanwhile, uh, 1904 to 06. With, in 1905, he starts writing Dubliners. Uh, these are short stories. Now, he applies a contractive method here to counteract the expansive method of Stephen Hero, which is too much information, too many chapters, too many banalities. And here, the short stories in Dubliners are mostly short. They get longer and longer as the collection goes along. They're mostly short, and they're very, very subtle and contractive. Um, and they do embody uh, the principle of the epiphany, which Joyce is famous for. And then, of course, um, so he publishes Dubliners in 1914. It takes him forever uh, because the publisher, uh, because of the unflattering portrait of uh, Dublin and a number of the people that are in the novel recognized themselves in, in the rather short story collection, uh, so that became a problem, and the publisher just didn't want to do it. So he had to go to another publisher, and finally got published in 1914. Two years later, then, he publishes A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man in 1916, which is the refined version of Stephen Hero, and it is a masterpiece. Stylistically, uh, it's a little, it's one degree more difficult to read than Dubliners. Dubliners is very straightforward, simple prose, uh, based on the sort of 19th century naturalistic novel. The stories are in the realistic mode still. Uh, and Portrait of the Artist is still also in the realistic mode, but it's far more stylized now. He's experimenting uh, with style. And that style, of course, explodes with Ulysses, which is published in 1922. 
it was starting to be serialized in the Little Review in 1918, uh, but published in 1922. It took him seven years to write it. Um, he conceived the idea uh, at the same time uh, that he had gone. He had spent his first 20 years growing up in Dublin. He meets his wife Nora Barnacle in 1904, who is from West Ireland, from Galway. He meets her, and then a year later in 1905, they leave and they go to Trieste, uh, an Austro-Hungarian port city. Uh, and uh, they leave and go there, and he teaches at the Burlitz School, makes a lousy living, uh, translating Yeats and Oscar Wilde into Italian, uh, taking on a, a students, uh, tutoring them in languages. Joyce was a language junkie. Um, and this is, becomes most evident in Finnegan's Wake, where he draws from almost all the languages that he knows, all kinds of different words, and sort of smelts them together in, into one single primordial ur language, a dream language. Um, so yeah, so we'll be looking, we'll go chapter by chapter through Ulysses. And then the monumental Finnegan's Wake, which is published in 1939, and it took him 17 years to write this monster. It's an absolute masterpiece. I believe that it's his best book, although the consensus of the Literary Academy is that Ulysses is not only Joyce's best book, but the greatest novel written in the 20th century. And I think I have to agree with that, although I prefer Finnegan's Wake. I think it is, it is quite a bit more of an achievement. It's just that it's so difficult to read. Far fewer people, even literary folk, ever actually manage to climb this literary K2 uh, than they do Ulysses. And then he died just a couple of years after that in 1941 from a perforated ulcer. They had to, the family was chased out of Paris, and he had to leave his uh, schizophrenic daughter, uh, Lucia, behind uh, in an institution which very much pained him and broke his heart. And they had to leave, uh, and he died in Zurich uh, in 1941, just shy of 59 years uh, of age. Um, so that's sort of the arc of Joyce's life. And uh, all right, so what I want to do then is concentrate on the stories and Dubliners here for our introductory class, because I think they're worth going over. There's 15 of them. Originally, there were 12, but because it took so long for the publisher to bring it out, um, he kept adding stories to it, so we added three more. Um, all right, so let's look at these stories now. As I say, they're written in a realistic mode, but Joyce draws a lot of uh, his imagery and ideas from Catholicism, which he rejected, and Stephen Hero uh, is a chronicle of his slow, gradual loss of his faith and disillusionment with Catholicism and his loss of faith in general. Um, so he said he called these, uh, these stories, we know about the epiphany, the sudden realization uh, that each of these characters has in this story. There's, there's a kind of realization that dawns on them um, that's modeled on the January 6th, which is the Catholic day of the epiphany, the showing forth of the Christ child. Uh, as an epiphany, as the, here it is, the, the, the self-luminous being from another world. So it's an epiphany in that sense, but he called these stories epicleti, from uh, epiclesis, which is an invocation of the Holy Spirit to transform bread into wine. And though these are still naturalistic stories, uh, it is a foreshadowing of what he will do with realism. Slowly through each of these novels, from Dubliners, the, the short story collection from Dubliners, to Portrait of the Artist, and then he writes a short play after Portrait of the Artist called Exiles, which I don't think is that great. But And he also has two short uh, poetry collections, also which are just kind of eh. Um, three minor works, I would say, but four great ones. Um, he transubstantiates the realistic uh, novel, especially with Ulysses. It's a full-blown uh, epiclesis, a transubstantiation that is going on of naturalism, which is perfused with spirituality all the way through. Everywhere you look in Ulysses, you will find the Holy Spirit at work in and through the world, in the world, imminent in the world, not like it is in Catholicism as above the world and only present in the host, in the bread and the wine. Not so for Joyce. The whole world is a spiritual epiphany. Everything in it is radiant with the divine. This is why, as we'll see in Ulysses, it's jam-packed with synchronicities. Joyce is developing the idea of the synchronicity in that novel long before Young ha has even written his book on synchronicity, which is he wrote in the 1950s and coined the term there. there. But Joyce had already figured it out and uh, jam-packs Ulysses with synchronicities, indicating the presence of the spirit in the material world. Um, God is the sound of a shot in the street. Uh, there's God. Um, that's one of the episodes uh, that we'll see from Ulysses. God is everywhere, the, the Holy Spirit, the presence of the divine. And this transubstantiates 
the mere shallow, empty realism of the 19th century naturalistic novel into a spiritual revelation, uh, which is one of the reasons why Ulysses is the greatest novel written in the 20th century, and why Joyce is, uh, without question, the greatest literary artist in English of the 20th century, possibly followed, seconded by Thomas Pynchon, I would, I would say. Um, all right, so let's look at the first story. So the first story begins with this. It's called The Sisters. Uh, and the stories are short, and they get longer and longer as we go along. And they begin with a first-person childhood narration uh, that then moves to adolescence, maturity, and then finally death with the last story, The Dead. So it covers the whole human life cycle. And it also moves from the private gradually to the public. With Ivy Day in the committee room, we move into the realm of politics, Irish nationalism, and so forth. And Joyce was an Irish na nationalist. He believed that Ireland should have an identity completely independent of England. Um, he wanted to break free of that as well as Catholicism. So with the sisters, we have uh, a child uh, of indeterminate age who writes a first-person narrative uh, account about two, two aunts um, of his, their sisters, and they are in mourning um, for a priest who has just died, uh, the Reverend, Reverend uh, James Flynn, who has just died. And he's sitting sort of in the room with them, quiet, uh, minding his own business, but, but listening to them. And um, he listens to their conversation, and it's adulation about this priest at first. Oh, what a great priest Father Flynn was. But then the conversation takes a, a subtle turn, and they, one of them says, Oh, did you hear that, that he messed up in Mass? He messed up uh, one of the Masses, and he broke a chalice. And the other one's like, Oh, really? Well, yeah, I did hear about that. You're right. And they found him wandering in the streets after a while. And the story ends with, uh, with them recounting how they found this guy in, the, uh, in the, the confessional booth. And they found him, before he was dead, uh, just laughing quietly to himself. So something broke this priest. We don't know what it is, but he has gone insane. Uh, and that's the sort of subtle epiphany of the story uh, that you have to figure out. These epiphanies, these stories are very subtle. And um, I remember in college when I first read them, I shrugged my shoulders. And I said, what's the big deal? I, these are just the realistic, boring accounts of people living in Dublin. That's not the case at all. You have these, the epiphanies are very subtle, and you have to pay attention to every single detail, every single word in these stories. In Joyce, every word counts uh, for everything he ever wrote. So the second story is also, it's called An Encounter, and it is also about um, two kids who are out playing hooky, uh, and they're out in a, in a field one day having fun, when this strange older man, this old fellow with a cane, comes wandering by and comes down and sits with them and starts asking them uncomfortable questions about whether they have girlfriends. Oh, surely you have girlfriends. I bet both of you have girlfriends. Oh, the warm yellow hair and the soft skin. And he starts going on and on about these girls. Then he gets up and he says, excuse me. He gets up and he goes over to a tree and they see him jacking off. So he's a total pedophile. Uh, the one kid wanders off then, uh, and then he comes back and sits down by the other kid, and he starts talking about how much he, he loves to paddle kids, how much he, he would like to beat a kid's ass. And so that's sort of how the story ends here with this, uh, this creepy guy. So notice the tone of the first two stories sets the tone of the whole collection. This is, this is going to be uncomfortable. And it is indeed a portrait of uh, very dismal people in Dublin living very dismal lives. Um, almost every story concerns a disappointment. The character of the epiphany in almost every stories, almost every story is is a disappointment, a realization that life has let you down. And uh, this is a portrait of Ireland, and it's not a flattering portrait. Um, this this uh, uh, collection shows Ireland as as a culture of losers, of schlemiels who can't get their act together. Uh, they couldn't even get uh, their, the nationalist movement uh, together. That, of course, will change with the 1916 Easter Rebellion, uh, which lays the seeds for the IRA, um, which happens later on. They eventually do get, get it together. Um, but this is not a flattering series of portraits of, of the Irish. And so we have in Araby, the next story, uh, another childhood uh, tale uh, about a boy who has, he's probably 12 years old, roughly, so we're moving into adolescence, who um, has a crush on a girl, and he really wants to impress her. And she tells him about the bazaar. There's, there's, a, there's a, a bazaar that's happening uh, downtown called Araby. And they have exotic uh, Arabian things that you can buy in this bazaar. And I wish I could go. It would be so great. And she says, you know, you ought to go. And he says, yeah, okay, maybe maybe I will. 
So he conceives the idea to get some money from his drunk uncle um, to go and uh, buy her something and bring it back from the bazaar to really impress her. And so the uncle has promised to give him the money and the Saturday night rolls around uh, and he's waiting and waiting and waiting past dinner time, gets on about 10, 10 o'clock. Finally, the drunk uncle comes in. He doesn't even remember that he told him he's going to give him money for the bazaar. And he does. He coughs up the money. So the kid grabs it quickly, hops on a tram that takes him directly to the bazaar. But by the time he gets there, all the stalls are closed except for two or three of them. And the one stall that he goes to see, uh, there's some cheap china, uh, some very cheap, unimpressive objects, and some pretty girl who's flirting with two guys who are trying to pick up on her. And she says, what, what can I do for you? What do you want? Just wanting to get rid of him. And he's like, well, never mind. No, thanks. So he leaves completely disillusioned with his little adventure. He will bring back nothing to impress uh, the girlfriend uh, or the woman, the girl that he has a crush on. All right. And then so with Eveline, then uh, we have the story uh, of this lonely woman. She's about 20 years old and she's living with her father. And her father is very abusive to her. Uh, verbally, and I'm not sure physically, but at least verbally ab abusive to her. And she's also taking care of two kids. Uh, they're someone else's kids. I forget where she's gotten them. And her life is just dull, boring, and miserable. There's no man in her life. But then finally, a guy does show up. And it's a guy, of course, that her father disapproves of, as all fathers usually do. And uh, so she has to go around his back to keep meeting this guy, who's a sailor. And um, he proposes, he not only proposes marriage to her, uh, but they have to do it secretly. Uh, but he proposes to take her away to Buenos Aires. Uh, so they're going go to go to Buenos Aires and start a new life. Um, and then so at the end of the story, she's waiting and waiting and waiting for the time to go out to the port, uh, to the dock, uh, to meet him. And she goes to the dock, and he does indeed show up, and he still wants to marry her. And he says, come on, let's go. But she can't do it. She suffers uh, from paralysis of the will at that point, knowing that she has... A miserable life to look back to if she goes back to her father but at least it's the nev the devil you know right the the miserable life at least she knows where she's terrified of what might happen in Buenos Aires a whole different world culture shock who knows so it's paralysis of the will so notice the disillusionment there it's similar to Araby the the two characters have this disillusionment oh that they're going to be on to something that's going to be great and wonderful and it turns into a major disappointment um and then we move to After the Race. And with After the Race, um, so we have this story of this Irish guy named Jimmy Doyle. And uh, he has three friends from the continent, two Frenchmen and one Hungarian guy. And they're all race car drivers. And so whatever passed for a race car around the turn of the century, whatever it is. So they have a little race uh, going through some street in Dublin. And then after the race, all four of them, they get out and they, they spend the entire night partying. Um, but these guys have money, and Jimmy Doyle doesn't. Uh, and he yearns to be, he's never been to the continent. Uh, hes They see him as this sort of provincial Irish schmuck. Um, he's never been to the continent, and he wishes he could go to France uh, and hang out with these guys. And so he has such a great night, uh, the bar hopping, getting drunk, uh, playing cards. And then finally, by the end of the night, um, he's out of money. He has spent every dime he has. But these guys still have money. They're still piling it on, so they're playing poker, and he's losing round after round after round. So now he has to sign up all these IOUs, one IOU after the next to these guys, and pretty soon he winds up completely uh, broke and impoverished. Uh, and the story ends with the Hungarian guy coming in. They're on a boat uh, coming in and saying, Daybreak, gentlemen, uh, back to Jimmy Doyle's reality where it's it's not so shiny, happy people anymore. Um, then we have two gallants. So with two gallants, we have these couple of guys who are around the age of 30, and the one guy uh, is younger. I've forgotten their names. Let's see, what were they? Um, Corley is the, 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 the ladies' man, and I think is it Lenahan? Corley and Lenahan. So Lenahan looks up to Corley because he uh, knows how to seduce women. And so he's talking to him about all the women that he seduced. Oh, I seduced this one and that one, and I, ha I spend all this money on these girls, uh, and we go out, uh, you know, we have sex, basically, we have a great time. And all through the story, uh, Lenahan keeps asking him, okay, well, do you think you can pull this off? Because he's fixated on one woman who's a young serving girl, a, a maid of some sort, and he's fixated on her. And so the reader doesn't know what he's talking about. What's he asking him to pull off? 
And he keeps saying, so you think you can do it? You think you can pull it off? And you're thinking, is he trying to get him laid? Or what exactly is happening? Uh, but that doesn't turn out to be the case because what happens as the story ends is he, he um, they separate. Corley goes to the woman. Uh, he's talking with her. And um, meanwhile, Linehan is, has a bowl of peas at a bar and a, and a beer. Uh, then he wanders around in the night shadows, sort of spying on them from across the street. And then uh, as the story ends, uh, the girl goes inside and then Corley comes up to him and he says, so were you able to pull it off? And Corley opens his, opens his palm and there's a gold coin on it. So in other words, they have conned this poor girl out of a gold coin. Previously, Corley had been bragging about all the money that he'd been spending on these women. Uh, but here he is conning money out of a maid who it is implied she probably stole this coin from her employer. Uh, and he conned it out of her. So not a flattering portrait here of the Irish at all. Now, one of these stories is flattering to the Irish. Joyce is absolutely ruthless. It's a little bit like Thomas Mann's aesthetic that he develops in, in, at about the same time and with a similar transformation of naturalistic storytelling to mythological stories of erotic irony, where it is the job of the artist to name the flaw ruthlessly, but then to have love. And I think that Joyce does love these people. He did love Ireland, especially after he, he left it, because he wrote about nothing else. Um, let's see, then we have The Boarding House, uh, which was a story about, yes, uh, Mrs. Mooney with her boarding house and her daughter Polly and her brother. Um, and they're, they're taking in men. So they have men in the boarding house. And then uh, the mother notices that Polly is spending time with one of the guys, uh, apparently a suitor. And uh, may have had, they may have gone and had sex somewhere, and this is absolutely unacceptable to her. He needs to marry the daughter. And so she tries to pull these machinations to get this poor guy uh, to marry the daughter. And unfortunately, he's a complete schlemiel, and the story ends with him realizing that he's trapped. He's going to spend a life of misery with a woman that he doesn't really love. Uh, he just had sex with her. Um, let's see. And then, so the next story after that is A Little Cloud, uh, which was... Um, yeah, a little cloud. So, about Ignatius Gallagher, and then a little a character, an Irish fellow named Little Chandler. And Little Chandler is a full-grown man with a wife uh, and also a young baby. And he is a man who did not follow his dreams, but Ignatius Gallagher did. Uh, dreams of being a writer. Ignatius Gallagher, on the other hand, has left Ireland and had a successful career as a writer on the continent. So now he has returned for uh, a brief night in a, in a tavern with little Chandler. And all he does is stand there making Chandler feel like a complete loser, which he basically is, because he didn't follow his bliss. He didn't become a writer. Uh, he went the life of a married life, which now he feels trapped in and realizes that his dreams are fading as a writer. They're not going to happen. And Ignatius just continually brags about all the great things that he's seen in Paris, all the fantastic things. And now I don't have any time uh, to talk with you anymore. We'll see you maybe another time. I got, I got another uh, I got another appointment. Bye bye. And it leaves Chandler feeling miserable. And the last scene is with him at home with his little baby on his lap, trying to read some poetry. I think it might have been either Wordsworth or Byron, uh, that he's trying to read. And the baby starts crying, and he yells at it to stop. And then the wife gets home just in time, and she sees what he's done, made the baby cry even worse, and she just makes him feel like a, a total loser, which he is. Then the next story, Counterparts, is about another loser. This is about a man who is employed in an office job. Uh, he's some sort of a scribe, a copyist. Um, and his boss, Mr. Allen, he, his name is Farrington, and his boss, Mr. Allen, calls him in to the room and chides him to, to his office and, and chides him uh, for doing a bad job and what's going on. And he's a drunk. Uh, and Farrington uh, is taking every little bit of money that he can possibly scrabble up to go to the bar and drink, which is his, his real life. That's his favorite thing. He has to spend the day working a shitty nine to five job that he doesn't like, doesn't want to do, and really hates his abusive employer, who's extraordinarily abusive to him. And finally, uh, he simply vaguely stands up for himself and he says, um, Mr. Allen says, uh, uh, tell me, he added, glancing first for approval to the lady beside him, his secretary, do you take me for a fool? Do you think me an utter fool? I don't think, sir, he said, that that's a fair question to put to me. And he thinks this is some big victory. So he manages to uh, get some money at a pawn shop by pawning his watch so then he can go to the bar and drink with his pals and tell them what a man he is now, that he stood up for himself 
uh, at the office to the boss. Uh, and they all say, oh, that's really great. Uh, we wish we could do that. Uh, and then they keep getting drunker and drunker. And then they have an arm wrestling contest with Farrington and some young kid. And Farrington has this macho image of this uh, self-image of himself as this big, strong guy. And the kid beats him uh, in the arm wrestling match. Um, and they start chiding him. And then pretty soon they're making fun of him instead of admiring him. And then so his counterpart situation is that when he goes home, uh, he is living there uh, apparently without a wife and a couple of kids. Or the mother is the mother's absent and there's a couple of kids. Uh, and he's drunk and he starts yelling at them to make his meal. Why didn't, where's his meal? And then pretty soon he starts beating up on, uh, he starts beating his, his child for not having his dinner ready. Uh, so that's a counterpart of the situation with the boss. And then so with the story Clay then, um, we have Maria, who's this older woman, unmarried. And um, it's set on Halloween. And so there, uh, she has purchased a, a, a plum cake from a shop and then she has to take a tram to go over to the house of Alfie and Joe, who are older men now, but she raised them. Uh, she, she, they regard her as, as their mother. She raised them when they were infants. And so it's Halloween. She's bringing the plum ginger cake uh, to them. And on the tram, an elderly gentleman starts flirting with her. And she's very flattered. Men hardly ever flirt with her. She's not very good looking by this point anymore. Um, and so when she gets to the house, she realizes that she forgot the, to bring the plum cake. Um, she left it on the tram because her attention was diverted with this older man flirting with her. And then so they play these little games where they blindfold her and then there's a series of dishes. So she has to put her hand out to grab whatever object is on each of these dishes and they are regarded, because it's Halloween, they're regarded as prophetic. Whatever thing you grab uh, is prophetic. And on one of the dishes is a wedding ring. So if she grabs that, it might mean, that, oh, she's going to get married. Instead, she grabs a dish of clay, and everyone falls silent. Uh, clay. Uh, not much of a future there. And then at the end, she's singing a ballad, and uh, the ballad that she sings, she sings the, the first verse over twice and forgets to sing the second verse, but the second verse is about a suitor uh, coming to woo a woman in marriage. So it's interesting that she forgets. So she pretty much is doomed. Um, she, this woman will spend her life in loneliness and misery. And then so uh, a similar story with a painful case about uh, a gentleman named James Duffy. He's probably around 30. He's got a happy life living by himself. He's a bachelor. Uh, he has, he's also literary. Um, he's quite fine and happy living by himself. But one evening he meets a woman named Mrs. Sinico. She is married and has a daughter. And uh, he takes an interest in her um, as a companion. And they start having lots of literary conversations, even though she's married. And so he insists that she invite him over to the house with, with the husband there uh, to make sure the husband knows about their encounters. And because the husband has written her off, he thinks that the young man is there to woo the daughter, who is only about a year or two younger than he is. Uh, he has no interest in the daughter. Uh, he's only interested in uh, Mrs. Seneca. And so they spend lots of time together, and they even go to a private cottage where they spend time talking. And at one point, then, uh, she comes on to him. She grabs his hand and puts it to her cheek, and he's like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't want that with you. I just wanted a friend. So he rebuffs her. And then four years pass. Four years later, as he's sitting in a cafe somewhere eating, uh, he finds an obituary, Death of a Lady, and it turns out to be her death. Mrs. Sinico, she has died because two years earlier she has been hit by a train, uh, or she has been recently hit, hit by a train, but that two years earlier um, the daughter had said that she had turned to alcoholism. And he slowly pieces it together that his rebuff of her led to her decline into loneliness and eventually death. It's implied that she was drunk when she was crossing the train tracks and the train hit her. He doomed her to this life. Uh, so another dismal story. Then with Ivy Day in the committee room, uh, we shift to the public sphere of politics with the realm of Charles Stuart Parnell, who dies in 1891, and he was a, an aggressive Irish nationalist, wanting uh, Irish unity uh, against the British and away from the British. Um, but here we have a, a group of men who are meeting in the committee room who are canvassing for a Mr. Richard Tierney um, at the coming election in the Royal Exchange Ward, and they're all just sitting around talking about the 
how they're just really doing this for money. They don't really have much interest in tyranny. And uh, they're not really doing anything. And the whole story transpires. It's kind of boring. But that's the point. These men are doing nothing for Ireland because the Irish can't get it together uh, to form uh, a unification movement the way Charles Stuart Parnell was doing before his career was ruined by a woman, Kitty O'Shea. And um, so they can't get it together. They start talking about Parnell, and it's Ivy Day, which is the day of the celebration of Parnell. Ivy is a symbol of fidelity because it clings to things. And um, it's also an evergreen, so it's a symbol of immortality as well. And uh, so nothing happens in the story because you know these guys are idiots and they're never going to get together to do anything at all for Ireland. Ireland in Dubliners is paralyzed as far as Joyce is concerned. It's paralyzed. So then we have a couple more stories before the dead. Uh, we have uh, a mother, which is a story about uh, a woman who has a daughter who is a pianist. And uh, she arranges for this woman to give four concerts uh, at the committee room. And then the concerts are a complete disaster. Uh, it's embarrassing. Uh, she gets cat calls and hooting from the audience, and it's a total embarrassment, and it just ruins her daughter's career. And then we get the story Grace, uh, which then is about a man who, uh, who actually, uh, Kernan, who actually turns up in Ulysses. Some of these characters do, like Bantam Lions, uh, to turn up in uh, Ulysses, uh, Tom Kernan, and uh, they find him, uh, he's totally drunk, and he's fallen down some stairs at the beginning of the story. And so a guy named Mr. Power picks him up, brings him back to his wife. And the next day he's visited by three guys, sort of like Job in his three companions. They visit him, uh, Mr. Power and, um, let's see, two other guys whose names I've forgotten. But they, they visit him and they try to tell him, you know, really, you should come with us. We're going to a Catholic retreat and we want you to come along with us. And he grudgingly agrees. He's... Protestant, but he converted to Catholicism to marry his Catholic uh, wife. Uh, so he agrees to go, and he, uh, he goes, and then uh, seems like maybe there might be some redemption for him. It's a kind of early version of AA, in other words, which was sort of done through the church back then. Uh, but it doesn't work, although the story doesn't tell you that. The story shows them in front of a priest attending Mass and so forth, and the priest's sermon. Uh, but he turns up in Ulysses drunk, so we know it didn't work. Uh, and then finally, the magnificent story, The Dead, here, which is the longest story in the collection and, and by far the best. Um, it was originally entitled The Last Supper, which is good that he changed it because The Dead has a much more universal resonance to it. And it's a story about Gabriel Conroy, uh, Gabriel Conroy uh, who's a writer, and his wife, uh, Greta. And uh, it takes place on the Epiphany on January 6th when they're having uh, a get-together uh, at his aunt's houses. And here we are, come back full circle with two sisters. We started with two sisters and the sisters, and now we have these two sisters, who's the third of whom, uh, Ellen, ha has died. We have Kate and Julia. So back to the, the aunts, two sisters, and they're having a big dinner party. And uh, so they arrive late. It's around 10 o'clock. They were waiting for, for the Conroys to get there. They finally arrive. Um, they're worried about Freddie Malins, who's, who's a drunk. and They're worried about him showing up drunk, which, which he does. Um, but they go ahead. They have dances and waltzes and so forth. Um, and the subject of the dead keeps coming up. People who have passed. Oh, yes, I remember this person and that person who died. Oh, remember them? Um, so there are constant references to the dead all through the story. And now, um, so there's lots of dialogue, and it's, it's very skillfully done. And John Huston's movie adaptation, The Dead, is, is quite well done. Um, probably the only Joyce film about Joyce that, that was successful. Uh, the film about him and uh, Nora, where he's played by Ewan McGregor, is ridiculous. Ewan McGregor is terribly miscast as Joyce. And um, so then it gets to the end of the story. Everybody's leaving, and they're going on the way out. And she hears uh, this opera guy upstairs who is singing uh, a ballad named uh, The Lass of Ogham. And she, he notices that his wife is upstairs, and all of a sudden she becomes very moody as she's listening to, this, uh, as, uh, to Bartle Darcy sing this song. And then he comes out and goes down, and they, everyone goes down to their trams, and they go to their hotel room, and Gabrielle has been looking forward to having sex with her all night. Um, apparently, it's been a while for them. Um, and so, um, Joyce talks about his lust, his rising lust, as they go back to the hotel room, but she's in no such mood, and she's moody at the window, and he says, what's going on, what's wrong with you? And she says, well, that, that ballad used to be sung by a lover of mine named Michael Fury, back in Galway, which is where Nora Barnacle was from, and this may be based on one of her previous lovers. 
um, back in Galway who died when he was 17 years old. And uh, I, lo- I really loved him, and he really loved me. And he realizes that she has never told him about this love affair that he had uh, before they met, um, that she has kept this secret the whole time, that a ballad unlocked from her the passing of this young man uh, at the young age of, uh, of uh, 17 years old. And then so she goes to bed, and the wonderful final scene with him standing at the window meditating on the dead, how everyone's going to become a, a shade. We're all one by one. He says, um, the air of the room chilled his shoulders. He stretched himself cautiously along under the sheets and lay down beside his wife. One by one, they were all becoming shades. Better pass boldly into that other world in the full glory of some passion than fade and wither dismally with age. He thought of how she who lay beside him and looked in her heart for so many years that image of her lover's eyes when he had told her that he did not wish to live without her. He basically died of pining uh, for her. And... um, But then it uh, makes him cry, and uh, we have the wonderful final paragraph, one of the best things I think Joyce ever wrote, about how we're all going to die, eventually. A few light taps upon the pane made him turn to the window. It had begun to snow again. He watched sleepily, the flakes, silver and dark, falling obliquely against the lamplight. The time had come for him to set out on his journey westward. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the bog of Allen, and farther westward, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling like the descent of their last end upon all the living and the dead. All right. There's Dubliners. Okay. So I know that some of you will not read Dubliners. So for those of you who didn't, you have a a, a brief sort of Cliff's Notes version of it here. Um, Those of you who do decide to read it and think that I've spoiled the stories for you, um, not really. With Joyce, everything is the execution and the beauty of the writing and the subtlety of it uh, in in this uh, wonderful book. So that sets us off in running for James Joyce. And then... uh, Next week, we'll read uh, the first chapter of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. So I look forward to uh, seeing you in class.